Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to see you all here in our panel, our discussion panel. And I think it will be great to start with the introductions. Who we have with us today? It's, of course, Emmanuel Daniel. He's the founder of the Asian Banker, Wealth and Society, and BankQuality.com. He continues to serve as an advisor and consultant to various governments and institutions, and is a highly regarded confidant in leadership circles. He is an esteemed global speaker on a variety of topics in the financial services industry and the development of the future of Asia. His first book on the future of finance will be published in the end of this year. We have Anna Chubinidze with us. She's a social scientist building the bridge with computer science, artificial intelligence with various organizations. She has been working on AI projects including governance, ethics, regulations, industry standards, and even ghostwriting strategy. She is a speaker at multiple events globally, and now she is the CEO of Adelan AI in Berlin, which focuses on AI governance, policy, and ethics consulting. She's advised organizations how to identify and address AI regular and ethical risks affecting the business and investment decisions in the EU and internationally. We have Emmanuel Goffi. He is AI philosopher, which is very interesting, and consulted on ethical particularism and artificial intelligence. Based on this, he's co-director and co-founder of Global AI Ethics Institute, which aims at opening the debate on AI ethics to all philosophical stances, wisdom, and perspectives coming from different cultures on our planet. And also, he is applying this philosophy on practice, uh, consulting Huawei on AI ethics and bring, making the bridge between different cultures from the business perspective. We have Aishwarya Srinivasan. She's AI and ML innovation leader at IBM Data and AI. She is an advocate for open source technologies and currently a developer advocate for PyTorch Lightning and previously a contributor to the Scikit-Learn. She is ambassador to the Women Data Science community originating from Stanford University. She actively organizes events and conferences to inspire budding data scientists. She has been spotlighted as a LinkedIn Top Voice 2020 for Data Science and AI, which features top 10 ML influencers across the world. And of course, Steve Norris. Steve is head of data science and AI at the Australian Computer Society, who has evolved the way people look at AI and innovations. He aims to inspire people through the latest technology trends and empower prospective data science through high quality educational content. He is an AI expert in the International Standards Organization, a member at the Forbes Tech Council, uh, two Australian ICT professional of the year and accomplished influence on LinkedIn. And myself, Alex Concher, I'm co-founder and machine learning director at Neurons Lab, machine learning consulting company. And today I'll be humbly listening to all the experts who are with me here. I want to bring us starting from the really high level strategy, philosophical and ethical questions and going a bit down a bit on the details, how it actually works. Maybe not from the technical side, but from the management side. How do we actually implement it? How do we control it? And how do we ensure that the philosophical wealth and educational activities that we start and develop actually go in the right direction? <laughs> and uh, starting with the philosophy, uh, there is a uh, thought that the philosophy of AI is kind of outdated because we're kind of just looking on the biases and patterns from the past instead of actually trying to develop something like that, new intelligence, new artificial intelligence. And uh, what we're actually doing, are we doing just uh, ethics, basically trying to look what humans did in the past? Does AI exist? And uh, Emmanuel Goffi, you as the philosopher, you can, you can start opening this topic. That's a really tough subject. Obviously, there is no truth about uh, AI. And, and, and its potential reality. But um, what I can say from the philosophical stance is that there is a lack of philosophical reflection. Lots of people are doing ethics without doing ethics. And that's really problematic when it comes to artificial intelligence because doing so, we are avoiding really deep and complex questions. Uh, the, the difficulty that we all have, I think, is to uh, bridge the needs of philosophy with the needs, the needs of, of uh, operational managers, right? Because time is not the same. So uh, on one side, you need to go really fast and you don't have that much time to spend into philosophical questions. On the other side, my side, uh, I think that we must take much more time. We, we, do have, we do need actually to go deeper into philosophy and to think about ethics, not just as a communication tool, but as a process to think about AI, its risks, its benefits. Emmanuel, you say that uh, the thing is that today people who are not ethicists, they're working on the ethics. And uh, what, is, what kind of problem it brings? Why 
for example, uh, the engineering approach or entrepreneurship approach might uh, lead us in the wrong direction from the ethics point of view. The, the point is that uh, uh, doing the ethics without having any kind of philosophical backgrounds uh, is not really doing ethics, right? It's a, it, ethics is a really complex field of study, so you need some, uh, some background, you need some knowledge, you need some skills in order to do that. What I've seen so far is that lots of people are just providing bullet points, solutions to really complex problems. And where I do not agree with Anna is that I don't feel like we are, uh, philosophy is re-emerging. It's a really superficial uh, layer of philosophy that is re-emerging, but we are not going deep into the questions that are raised by artificial intelligence. And you were mentioning that, Alex, at the very beginning, is AI something that really exists or is it only kind of a narrative, a speech hack, actually, because we don't know what artificial means exactly. We don't know what intelligence means. So I don't know how we can pretend that artificial intelligence exists. This is the kind of question that we can have. And regarding, for example, biases, also we are all discussing about biases as we are rediscovering that human beings are made of biases. Our whole life is made of, of biases. So when we're trying to just remove biases from artificial intelligence, we are not trying to mimic or duplicate brain or uh, human intelligence it, if, if it ever exists. We are trying to do something that is kind of idealistic in the sense that we're trying to do something that would be perfect in the sense that there would be no flaws in, in, this, uh, in this system. So these are the kind of questions that we are not asking because once again, we have to go fast because companies need to go fast, obviously. Uh, and, and sometimes we are just uh, you know, uh, putting aside the very complex questions that do take time. And at the very end, what will happen is that we are doing what I call cosmetics. We are just hiding uh, the reality behind the view of ethics. We're just summoning the vocabulary of ethics without doing that uh, really well. But I feel like on the long run, it will pose a lot of problems because we are not asking the fundamental question about what kind of society do we want for the future? Yes, and each and every society, not only the Western society. Where do we want to go? We don't know that. We don't ask that. We're just assuming that AI is here and we have to deal with that. And then we have to find solutions to existing problems. And this is something that is really problematic because we, are, we will not find any kind of, of good solution with that. And I want to ask Steve and Anna, because my bias is the action and to the processes and to the metrics. I know that Steve is working on the ISO standards and regulations for today. I know that Anna is consulting companies on this. When you work with regulations, you work with companies, you can you require you require a plan, you require metrics and some actions. How do you merge the philosophical ideas and some actionable plan which you can actually measure and improve? Human are biased and and we all know that um, not all the bias are bad. Like we do have certain characteristics that are uh, protected and uh, we should make sure that AI is not biased against them. And also we need to understand what do we uh, think about the fairness? What do we think about all the pillars of the ethics that we're uh, discussing as a framework? In the um, ISO and other all the standards organizations, they're essentially thinking about um, how they can come up with best practices and um, ideas that can become a roadmap for societies, for governments, for um, um, legal organizations to make ensure and enforce some of these standards um, that are very important and crucial. But at the end of the day, if you want to have a definitive solution for this, I'm, I'm going to um, um, say, unfortunately, we don't have it yet. Um, we are walking through the process. There are lots of great advances um, in terms of explainability of the AI, understanding all the characteristics of uh, you know, uh, decision-making, um, and this would help, but uh, this is an open discussion that we are having, and that's why the organizations exist. They they want to bring experts together, and they would think about the problems that are um, right now um, open discussions in the society. So let me let me just uh, take Emmanuel Goffey's position and and try and uh, make it practical. Okay, I'm here in Beijing, uh, and then I read the foreign newspapers and I read the Chinese newspapers as to what uh, some of the ethical issues in technology are. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, the issues that Facebook and Twitter and all of the social medias that were created in the 2000s, in 2007 or so, um, 
in my view, and I see it very uh, graphically, um, have a different set of AI issues than uh, the platforms that were created in the 2010s. Uh, and the platforms that were created in the 2007s, they were, they were desktop-based platforms. Uh, you know, and the focus there uh, was on generating uh, lots of users, uh, you know, creating user-generated content and so on. Um, and uh, it, the whole idea was to create addiction uh, you know, to platforms and so on. Um, by the time you reach 2010, uh, in China, for example, you have uh, uh, WeChat and Alipay and Ali, Alibaba and so on. Um, um, all of these had their iterations in the 2000s. I, I, at the same time as the Western social media was starting, they basically copied them and, and they tried to uh, re replicate that in China. Uh, but on the desktop model, it never worked. It didn't work very well. Um, and, but when it went on to mobile, uh, it then created a whole different ecosystem that today I see a, a, a fundamental difference in the challenges of AI being applied uh, to social media, Western social media, and AI being applied to what I would call mobile-based social media. Um, you know, um, the, the, the Western-based social media, very, um, you know, subscription-centric, very, um, you know, publishing-centric, very content-centric, uh, whereas the mobile-based um, um, platforms uh, have community creation ecosystem type uh, issues, uh, which have more to do with, um, you know, privacy issues and so on, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, siloing uh, the users into, uh, into habits, into, um, into addiction and so on. Um, and I, uh, because I, you know, cover financial services more than any other industry, um, what I see uh, is going to happen uh, is that another iteration of uh, AI is going to come about, which is a high degree of personalization. Now, when you get into a world that is device independent, uh, you're going to start seeing a whole new set of ethical issues uh, coming about. So for example, uh, on the mobile device uh, for, you know, for GPS, for example, you onboard into an, a GPS app and the GPS app then collects all of the data and then makes that available to you telling you where you are. But in a mobile, in a device independent uh, platform, your, your device might well be the, you know, the collector of data that tells you where you are. In other words, you don't need to um, you know, then go on to another, um, a, a, another device or another platform or, a, or an application to, to discover where you are. Now that then creates personalized, personalized um, issues in ethics, you know, uh, what data is personal to me that I have the right not to share to people and so on. So this is my contribution to what Emmanuel, Emmanuel just said, uh, you know, a practical um, evolution as I see uh, having taken place over time. It's also a culture, cultural, you know, uh, a point of view that you have to take into account to working with Huawei, as I was saying, the, the mindset in China, for example, regarding privacy is not the mindset that we have in the West, in France, in the US, etc. Right. So you also have to take that into account when you're doing ethics, you have to. Uh, and that, that's really difficult. I know that you have to withdraw from your own, you know, a priori Westerners, a priori about what is acceptable, what is not, what is good, what is bad, etc., etc., just to adjust. And that's the difficulty with, with ethics is that it's it must be really flexible. Uh, so far, what I've seen is much more kind of a tendency to try to impose some Western uh, standards based on Western issues and Western concern to the rest of the world. And, and this is something that I feel we, we think we, we should think about. Definitely uh, uh, Confucian uh, thinking is not, you know, Christian thinking, which is not the same as Ubuntu thinking, because we're talking about that uh, Shinto thinking. And, and, uh, and for those who are working with the IEEE, uh, they've clearly stated that this kind of philosophy, this kind of wisdoms or spiritualities must be brought into the debate just to enrich it and to avoid having this kind of unique on one fit all solution to really complex and diverse uh, uh, issues or cases that you were mentioning, Emmanuel. In fact, uh, what you just said about uh, the values being different uh, explains very quickly, very clearly why certain um, you know, community-based applications were very successful in China uh, and may not have ever gotten off the ground uh, in the US or in Europe. Um, but what's interesting is um, what I see here in China, even among my own employees, uh, is that uh, there's a greater sense of self-awareness and there's a greater sense of 
personal um, assets, uh, you know, what's mine and, and uh, um, you know, what's valuable to me. Uh, and I think that's a globe that is a global phenomenon and, and it's evolving. And I see uh, Chinese young people being very mindful, uh, increasingly mindful uh, of what they consider to be personal assets. And I think that AI as a technology and here, Emmanuel, you might you might uh, give me a dimension on this um, is actually heading towards uh, increased personal enrichment. At the same time, it's uh, it's uh, it's actually uh, you know taking away personal um, you know uh, um, uh, rights uh, in a way uh, you know uh, uh, the, the technology is taking us that way. It's it's giving us rights and it's taking away rights from us uh, at the personal level. Uh, and I think that that uh, dimension uh, is something that all of us suffer uh, regardless of where we we come from. So we probably need to identify. The, the elements that are that are universal, uh, you know, we, we come back again to the philosophical question of universality. What what is universal? Personal rights is that universal? Um, you know, uh, uh, privacy is that universal? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So you know, th those are some of the issues. One of the points that Emmanuel um, uh, Emmanuel Goff mentioned that you know we are trying to pull out the bias out of the system, and the reason behind that is that we do address that there exists those biases and it's not right to have those biases because that itself is pulling out the uh, the fundamental right of people to have equal equ equality in things like having that equal equal rights having that equal say in in situations and having um, equal access to uh, like products and services if i may say so that's where like companies are driving a lot and focusing a lot towards building trustworthy AI systems. Some of them call it as responsible AI systems or ethical AI systems. And this is not as simple as just having, you know, like the ethics part in, in mind. And I'm coming from a technical background and I have been helping in building these AI systems uh, from a product standpoint. So I can say that uh, when we are building these systems, right from uh, like a smaller application, or it could be something which is integrated in an organizational flow, or it could be something which is, you know, a, a business to customer or a business to business uh, service. So in all these situations, we are looking at five different pillars. And these five pillars pretty much encompass things uh, that we were discussing as one of the one of the concerns. So it does encompass having like fairness and uh, device devising in the model. And that is because we want to see that, you know, uh, having the fundamental human right of equal opportunities. I feel with time, these technology are helping us understand what are some of the fundamental humanitarian problems in the society. And how can we see them through a data perspective? How can we see them from an evidence perspective? And how can we work on it to rectify it? So now that we have this you know, data in front of us, which is giving us, um, giving us a heads up that, hey, this is what is happening in the society and this is what we are moving towards, then we can take those uh, remedial steps to understand and how we, how we can rectify such things happening in the society. The second thing, the second pillar uh, after fairness would be robustness. And this is connecting to what uh, Emmanuel Daniel was saying that every country has different sets of rules, different sets of priorities, different ways of how technology is handled, uh, different demographics and various different factors. And this is where we want the models to be robust and adjust towards different uh, schemas in the society this being attached with the third pillar of privacy. Because when we are developing these models or like these AI systems, they are being built on top of different regulations coming from, from different countries. All these are various steps which are taken, uh, which are being like initiated by different countries or different states for that matter to protect the data, to protect the rights of their citizens, right? And this is where we see a difference in the in the regular uh, in the governmental uh, procedures for example some of the countries have data localization embedded in their in their system that itself poses a challenge for companies to pull out the data from all their users who might not be in their same base country in that situation federated learning plays a huge role because we are trying to say that now we are decentralizing uh, the data the data is still going to be decentralized while we are, tra are training the models on a central server. So things like that are being addressed. 
and um, another point which i was uh, i was interested to mention is explainability imagine a world where we are able to attach explainability to all our models and we say that we are historical activities because of which uh, your score was affected in a certain way and your premium has been increased or decreased so attaching that explainable part into the ai models help us help people uh, trust more on the ai systems and the final pillar is transparency so the fifth pillar and the final pillar is transparency this is where we say that uh, you know we are pulling out every information uh, about the model about the services that we are building and we are telling the users that your data has been has, is being used in these different scenarios for example currently if i use my phone i have no idea um, if uh, the alarms that i'm setting up is that data being used somewhere is uh, if i'm typing something on my keyboards is that data being tracked somewhere where is this data being sent to and how is it being used that is something none of us probably know at, at current situation where we know that there is some trackers which are sitting in our phones or our computers but we don't know what data is being collected we don't know where is it being used and how is it how are the recommendations of these models being sent back to us that's where the transparency part fits in and i i promise that a lot of companies are actively working on all these five pillars manuel daniel from the in the financial industry for example all these problems like explainability and fairness uh, how do you, how do you see them in your experience what do you see like maybe the cases that ca- actually happen the most often and they're the most painful let me tell you this sir um in financial services the business that i'm in is to assess banks uh, in all the regions that in which we operate so we actually collect data on um on uh, on on ai projects that all banks um um uh, you know uh, perform um and let me tell you that um i've just gone through the list of um a number of the leading initiatives um you know chatbot uh, robo advisors um you know um for tra- transaction banking fraud um you know um uh, fraud and so on uh banking or financial services right now whether in asia or anywhere in the world uh is still uh very inward looking uh the ai is not being deployed for the customer as yet even though it's being sold as uh being for the customer and the mindset of financial services the industry today uh is still stuck in the um you know industrial era it looks like a customer enhancing experience actually at the back end it's a cost saving um um you know platform uh you know with a chatbot you don't need to have a call center with with uh, you know with robo advisors um you know you you need to reduce the expense that you have on wealth managers uh and you even create the bias uh, into your robo advisors um so the thing is that financial services is really a, a follower rather than a leader uh but the agenda is being uh, imposed on them so when we think about tokens today for example or cryptocurrencies and so on um you know whether or not whichever side of the aisle you are on uh it's now creating a new level of personalization uh and and actually the ai can uh even sit on the token uh you know uh, and and carry a lot more intelligence uh than it is right now and a lot of work being done on that front uh, blockchain and and all that um i was actually curious with ashwari's uh, comment just now on accountability um and i wanted to ask because this is an area where i don't have a sense but um open ai for example uh, you know as a platform for greater transparency and and accountability and self checking mechanism within the industry um i when i saw what happening what happened in uh, you know in open source technology ibm bought one and uh, microsoft bought another uh, open source platform uh, they were intended to be uh, vendor neutral uh, you know and open uh, you know to to all of the world it, it's not it was never meant to be industrialized or uh, owned by a corporation as it were uh, the interesting thing about ethics in ai for example open ai is a, a source of ethics um, compliance and ethics um, you know self checking mechanism um, what prevents that from being corporatized because um, when 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 any element of uh, uh, of uh, integrity uh, is corporatized then it becomes 
uh, you know, compromised in, in a sense. So I, I was curious when, when she was making those comments, um, you know, um, uh, whether any of you have an opinion on open AI and whether that helps to ameliorate, um, you know, accountability in AI. One of the reasons which, where I really love this open source community concept is the push towards research. And that's probably one of the missing pieces when it comes to corporate world, because mostly in corporate settings, you are, uh, you are driven towards a business value. You're, cre you're driven towards producing numbers. And that, that's how businesses work, right? So that's probably one of the biggest focuses for every business. Whereas in, in a community where we are trying to build technology, open source is something that pushes more towards research. And that's what pushes companies to work towards a, a similar goal. So things like when, when we're talking about communities like OpenAI, they are setting up these standards, which uh, I wouldn't say should be, but they are being followed by various different companies to maintain their standpoint on such kind of technology and research going behind. It's very interesting because actually also I know that the AI is actually growing so fast because of this open culture, because this is almost only a scientific field where actually so many things have been open, so actually we can reuse them, we can use them freely to build applications, to try it out in the real world. Actually, what's interesting that uh, it, I think also one of the reasons that investors, they actually start having a look at the open source side. There's a recent case of the Hugging Face library, which started as an open source project that developed in the tools for NLP. And now basically they're a startup with uh, investments. And uh, what do you guys think? Uh, what should, the, should is, is like the future of the business models for the open source? So the reality is most of these open source uh, projects are being backed by either corporates or they're using this as a um, mechanism to get some sort of more visibility or drive uh, some, um, some customers. And that's, uh, that's what we are seeing here. Um, a lot of these uh, um, open source projects that have been open sourced by Microsoft, Facebook, or um, OpenAI, um, they um, they are being used to actually um, deliver a lot of visibility and credibility for the company at the same time. And uh, on the other hand, many individuals are actually entering these open source communities and then leveraging the open source to have a backend kind of uh, a business project that will run on this, um, uh, you know, uh, library or platform and uh, become corporate rise. So, so that's the, what, what is the kind of trend that we are seeing. Um, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing necessarily. It's like the word uh, runs on numbers and, and uh, everything needs to, needs to be some sort of, um, have some incentive. And that's the reality. Like um, you, you can't just uh, run, an, um, uh, run an organization or community by itself without having any sort of incentive. Uh, but it's, it's a, still, it's a great way to um, um, I guess, bring the value back to the community, get them involved, um, let the research going on and, and instead of having the closed kind of source environment, which we, it used to be the time that I was a um, um, software engineer, um, Microsoft was leading that kind of, kind of environment and everybody kind of uh, were, um, you know, kind of competing against such a, um, you know, closed environment that, um, keeping everything IP and, and making sure everything is um, only available um, um, from, from the company. Some of the biggest technologies which we, have, which we see currently have started as not a business value generating scheme. Like developing and working on these technologies have a vision that what is possible. For example, one of the projects which, uh, which I, I keep following is Project Loon. And that is something which uh, has not really, you know, driven a business or has not is not uh, generating that sales number for them. But that is something which is pushing us to uh, pushing us towards thinking that hey, like, do we have the internet accessibilities in all these places? And if not, then what are the possible ways to help these people who are living or the communities living in these locations where internet access is not available? And imagine one day without internet. Like for us even a day without internet seems scary. So if you, if you think about people who are living in these areas who have no access to internet, 
they might be missing on a lot of a uh, lot of information and that's why we try to produce that hey like these kind of works which are probably towards a cause probably towards some social good and not directly be working on numbers are also very important so that's where i feel like having this you know like this ideology of um okay i'm building something for a greater good is good because it's it's somewhere pushing boundaries and like what is possible and what's not but when you say i want to access this technology open source in the regions where there is no in how do you measure it and basically this is what i'm kind of trying to push our consensus to think there are a lot of good ideas and we are all good in talking about the ideas but when we start doing when we work with our customers we work with our partners we start some activity and then the week and the month we need to say okay where we are are we going closer to the goal or not so basically with the open source what what could be measured this I understand maybe not it should be financial metrics but at least we should know that every day every week every month we're going in the right direction so one is starting with the mission statement right for example any open source community or like any open source project has a mission statement towards it so this is what we are trying to solve and for open source one of the best ways to measure their impact is through community like how is it impacting the community how many users do we have how has it changed their uh, turnaround time uh is is my technology helping them do something faster is my technology helping them do something better or is it uh is it probably addressing a problem uh addressing a community which was not really in line light or good so just help getting a feedback from the community is very important when it comes to like such open source projects one question of uh, of ethics which which is uh, which is sort of coming out from this conversation is this who should fund uh an ethics project uh should it be private enterprise or should it be state now you know we are all in different continents right now you know the us uh, europe and china and and asia and and the philosophies are so different in each of these continents that in the us uh, a company like ibm uh, is able to fund uh non-profit making projects for a long time for 10 years and then uh you know burn rate and and so on it they, they can absorb that um in in europe uh you know the state seems to be very involved um, you know subsidizing a lot of these programs in china the state becomes involved uh it becomes a geopolitical issue uh you know and so the state is not consciously or obviously involved but um you know you 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 have companies like huawei uh who are funding it uh who who say that they're funding it uh, out of their own resources in that way um you know the the thing is that um the role of the state the role of private enterprise and the role of the individual um you know um um and each of these uh are sort of trying to um, affect each other you know what's interesting in financial services is banks are are really bad investors uh in new technology and and bad investors in the infrastructure for new technology including uh uh ethics um they they usually buy it in after it's been created um and uh the one thing that makes banks very bad in fact investors in ethics uh is that uh, financial services itself is a regulated uh industry uh in other words there's already a bias built in a bias to uh protect the continued survival of the industry uh and and so they 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 are sort of users of um ai rather than uh, builders of ai uh, you know uh, and and whatever technology you build outside of financial services you got to hand it over uh, because the regulators will make you hand it over and so on um so so what is a um you know an acceptable neutral platform uh that is fair as you say and and uh, um you know and and that is um and also accountable um you know to to the end user so all of the infrastructure that uh, ashwari mentioned just now explainability and so on uh, all that is good intention but if um if it is in the hand of private enterprise uh it's done with profit uh, as the motive if it's in the hand of state uh, you know there there are uh you know philosophical issues which are different from from a commercial and and, and you know issue and stuff like that so so i'm curious you know how that will evolve Yeah, I would say that if I if I were to look at uh, at United States or like Western Western universe, it's uh, it's mostly driven by tech companies. It is driven a lot by tech companies. So I feel like and and all these industries, for example, like companies like IBM, Google, Facebook, Netflix, everybody is playing their role in 
building systems which are more uh, robust or like building systems which are more trustworthy. So I, I do not really see a concern that, you know, companies are driven by business value, but also they want to build something which is a resilient uh, platform. Like they want the, it's not that they want their business goals in, just in short term, but they want it in longer term, right? And that's where it is also beneficial for them to attach all these components to the systems that they're building, which will help them stay stabilized in a longer period of time. I don't think that it's really relevant to make a difference between states and private company. Uh, I feel like uh, most of the time they work end in end, definitely. And, and whatever it is private or public, they all have kind of certain benefits that they're looking for. Uh, it can be, uh, you know, uh, financial benefits, can be strategic uh, benefits uh, in terms of diplomacy. Uh, so, so whatever the actor, they will have something in mind. That's the big issue that we have in philosophy is that most of the time, all those principles that have been mentioned, explainability, transparency, et cetera, they are, they are presented as kind of deontological tools, meaning that they are principles that you cannot violate, right? Because they are fundamental for human beings, this kind of things. But on the other hand, what we see is that the reality behind that is that everything is really consequentialist. Uh, when you're talking about explainability, for example, or transparency in terms of AI, it's really nonsensical because transparency doesn't make sense if people that you are showing what is going on in the black box are not able to understand it. Most of the time I make this comparison with me when I go to the mechanics, right? You open the trunk, show me what is happening in the motor, explaining me everything but I'm not able to understand. It is perfectly transparent, but that does not change anything because I'm unable to understand. So you can be really transparent. I've tried to go through this kind of algorithm. There is a, a French newspaper that has released these algorithms. And if you're not a tech guy, if you're not a computer scientist, you will not understand. They can be transparent that they want, it will not change anything. So all this kind of transparency, explainability is a way just to move the, the, uh, the responsibility, the accountability on the shoulder of the user saying, oh, you were aware of that, you knew it, we showed you what is, what is happening. So you cannot say that you were not aware of what was happening with your data. It's much more that than really a deontological point of view saying that people have to know because people cannot know if they're not able to understand. And myself, when I'm looking, for example, at the setting of the cookies, when you go to a website, I cannot do that. So I just accept them. So if I do something wrong, what I would be told is, oh, you were aware, you had the choice, you could set your own cookies the way you wanted, but I'm unable to do that, right? So it's all about, once again, interest, vested interest, may be public or private, that does not change anything. The big issue that we have here is that most of the time, people, I mean, real people, those from the street, are not into the debate. They are not participating. They do not have any kind of say. You have people that are supposedly representing people, right? Like say France, you have the government and the authority. So all this wording that has been created, once again, it's mainly cosmetic, it's narrative. It does not mean anything. Trustworthy AI, Professor Thomas Metzinger was a part of the panel of uh, high level experts uh, writing the guidelines for trustworthy. He left because what he was saying is that at the very end, it's just a narrative. It's just a bedtime story as he wrote it, right? For, for consumers, just to create artificially kind of a trust, but AI itself cannot be trusted because it has no intention. It's not autonomous. You can trust people that are developing it. You can trust people that are using it, that are deploying it, but you cannot trust the system because trust is based on the probability that the other agent will you know, cheat on you or not. So if we consider that AI is not autonomous enough, that there is still human in control, we cannot talk about trustworthy AI. And it's a way just to move once again, the focus from the individual people that are behind those algorithms and those systems toward a technical tool, right? When I take the plane, I don't wonder if I can trust the plane. All this wording, and that's really philosophical, must be questioned because we all take it for granted. All the time I hear exactly the same wording with the same argument, with the same principles, but with no in-depth you know, uh, analysis or just thinking, oh, what does that mean, trustworthy AI? Does it even mean something? Trustworthy AI doesn't mean anything because AI does not exist because artificial does not mean anything because intelligence is impossible to define. So how can something that you cannot define be real? 
right? So this is the kind of question with all this wording that we really have to, uh, at some point, I, I don't know what, what is the reality behind that, but I'm, I'm just wondering why we're not asking this kind of question. And I feel like it's not only a matter of people that are involved into that, uh, because it's not enough to say, oh, you were aware of the rules. You were aware that you could set your own cookies. You were aware because that was transparent, that was explainable and all that stuff, because most of the people, myself included, we are just scrolling without even thinking about it. We are just accepting all the cookies because we don't have time to go into that to set all the cookies for each website that we will consult, right? So this is mainly cosmetics. It's just a veal, right? So even if the intention are good sometimes, it doesn't lead to anything good at the very end. I see that in our conversation, we literally are kind of like trying to balance between two things. One is that the, the wealth creation, economics, and the, all the related to this. And then after the wealth is created, they need to create some value, like maybe human value. And that's hard to do this. And uh, as you get to you try to balance between philosophy and actions, wealth and ethics. I want to ask every one of you to give two advices, maybe two books, two blogs, two videos. One on the kind of philosophical philosophy topic, ethical topic, basically where to go another one what to do what can be the next step just to so our listeners they go to the first source and they get motivated they get a direction and then they go to the second source and this can be the immediate value of the discussed my advice would be just be curious make your own opinion build your own opinion just don't buy things that you find mm -hmm. here and there and sometimes try to uh, look at uh, outside the box just try to make your own opinion just go uh, uh, in terms of philosophy, uh, go back to to the uh, to, to to philosophers instead of reading analysis of philosophers. Right, uh, uh, that, that's great to have people that are interpreting, but it's also great to build your own opinion. So just just be curious, read whatever you want, but read a lot and read diversity. Uh, for me, I would say I would go with a book. I I know that I haven't read a lot of them, but. Um, one of them I really liked was um, the AI superpowers by um, Kai Fu Li. Um, and I guess it would give us a little bit more understanding of what's happening in the war and what to expect. Um, one thing that I'm um, very worried about is uh, the um, superpowers, especially using AI in, in uh, some sense that uh, might be um, used in a competitive way or um, I would say even uh, bolder than that, being weaponized. And that's something that we need to be very, very aware of. And uh, people need to be very conscious, ask the questions following Emmanuel's um, um, advice, always uh, think outside the box uh, and make sure that uh, uh, don't take anything for granted. Things uh, will, will change quickly and will affect everybody's life, lives. AI is... Uh, uh, is a super tool, whatever we call AI, machine learning, or whatever it is. Um, this is very powerful and um, will have a huge impact. If it goes wrong, it will hugely go wrong. I've uh, I read uh, Kaifu Lee's book. The interesting thing is that uh, all the books that are very popular on AI at the moment uh, has to do, except for Kaifu Lee's book, right, uh, has to do with Oh, AI is going to change our lives. You know, we we uh, we we shouldn't be afraid. Um, you know, it's not going to take away our jobs and 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 stuff like that. And how do we deal with AI? You know, um, um, and and how do we make uh, use of uh, algorithms and so on? I'm also familiar with the Life 3.0 book, right? Uh, Being human uh, in the age of AI. Um, so so many of these books are are, are designed to help us um, help us. Um, imagine uh, what's going to happen to us as a result of AI. You know, what's going to happen to my job, my lifestyle? Uh, am I going to be, you know, fooled by an algorithm? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. And the thing about Kai Fu Lee's book is that there's only one or two chapters in there on AI. The rest of it is the history of, uh, you know, FinTech and, and, and uh, platforms in China. Um, so, so the thing is that uh, the book that I haven't read um, is a book that, what does AI make corporations into? Um, if you look at what platforms made corporations into, if you look at what platforms did to Facebook and Twitter and so on, it's that it's turned them into governments. You know, and what are governments asking them to do? They're, they're asking them to moderate uh, society. 
um, you know, and, and governments are sort of outsourcing that responsibility to these platforms because they are all encompassing, they are all powerful, right? And uh, when AI becomes increasingly institutionalized, uh, the question is, um, you know, what is the role of um, uh, business, of industry, um, you know, and, and, uh, and who is government uh, in, in, that, in, in that realm? Right. So, yes, you can be self um, uh, administering, you can be, you know, self regulating um, the, 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 the realm of self regulation has passed now, uh, you know, anything that's new, uh, that is uh, all encompassing uh, needs and external regulators. I think if we if we restate what is the end goal that we are trying to achieve in ethics and then work backwards. Uh, to understand uh, what kind of books need to be written in the first place. Um, the, the primers as to what AI is going to do to our lives, to, to our jobs, uh, that's past. Uh, we're now entering a realm where what AI is potentially going to do to society as a whole. And that's the, that's the final goal, the, 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 the top price uh, in AI ethics. Uh, what is the uh, ultimate destruction capable uh, when, when AI ethics breaks down. And, and actually, in the platform era, we've already seen what's already happening, which is there's great confusion in governance. Um, you know, and, and AI is going to accentuate that. Uh, and it's going to create new players. Uh, many governments missed the opportunity to govern the platform era as it was evolving. Uh, and from that, we've learned a lot that we now need to figure out uh, what governance should look like um, as AI becomes more institutionalized and, you know, as new sets of corporations uh, take over, um, you know, the, the running of AI, um, you know, as a business, or as a platform. Um, I mean, that, that would, and that's the kind of book I'm looking for. When we have ideas, we have plans, we can wrap it up and uh, keep working on making AI useful, ethical, and potentially open out to us good, nice horizons of potential as a, as a human species, not just as uh, cultures or people and individuals or countries. Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm.